Hi everyone, my name is Kirsten Sungard Muma and I'm a PhD candidate in education at Harvard University. Today I'm going to be presenting my job market paper, which is co-authored with Blake Heller, a PhD candidate in public policy at Harvard on immigrant integration in the United States, the role of adult English language training. So in the United States, immigration policy is focused on selecting immigrants on the front end as opposed to uh, supporting immigrants after they arrive. We have a very laissez-faire integration policy. And as a result of this, levels of public investment in building the skills of adult immigrants are low and basic facts about the returns to these investments are unknown. So in this paper, we seek to address some of those gaps in our knowledge, and we do this by looking at the returns to investment in a public adult education program that builds a very specific, very foundational set of human capital, English language skills. So why should we care about host country language skills? Well, from a theoretical perspective, we say that language skills are complementary to other forms of human capital, meaning that the returns are higher, for immigrants with higher levels of educational attainment, technical expertise, et cetera. In the empirical literature, we see that language skills are strongly associated with measures of immigrant integration across multiple domains. So immigrants with higher levels of host country language proficiency earn more and are more likely to be employed. They have higher levels of educational attainment. They show higher measures of social integration in terms of having relationships outside of their national or ethnic group, living outside of an ethnic enclave, et cetera. They're more likely to be politically engaged. That's something that I'm considering in related research. And there appear to be positive spillover effects from parental language abilities onto the educational outcomes of their children. So what is the state of English proficiency in the United States today? Here is a graph that shows the growth of the limited English proficient population. That's the purple line over time. The green line is a population that speaks a language other than English at home. Today, there are over 25 million limited English proficient or LEP Americans. And this population represents about 10% of the working age population. So it's a big part of our workforce. This is a population that's grown expansively, especially since the 1990s. So the LEP population today is 90% bigger than it was in 1990. And that change in the LEP population is, of course, closely related to trends in immigration, the number of immigrants entering the country, the types of immigrants and their starting levels of English proficiency. But it is also perhaps related to trends in the rate at which new immigrants are acquiring language skills. So here's a graph from a paper by Borjas that looks at this issue. What he's plotting is the English proficiency of immigrants over years spent in the US. And he's showing that more recent cohorts of immigrant arrivals appear to acquire language skills more slowly than earlier cohorts did. So what are we doing to promote the acquisition of English language skills in the US? Well, this is where adult education programs come in. Adult education programs provide no-cost services to adult learners outside of the traditional K-12 and higher education systems. About half of the work done by adult education programs is dedicated to ESOL or English for Speakers of Other Languages programs. Other services include high school exam preparation, basic skills training, digital literacy, etc. Every year we spend a billion dollars on ESOL programs and these programs reach 700,000 students nationwide. And that may seem like a lot, but of course it's a small fraction, less than half of a percent of the adult population that could benefit from these services. And in fact, enrollment in adult education has fallen as funding for adult education has decreased. So funding for adult education in real dollars has declined by about 30% since 1990. And that's the same period over which the LEP population has almost doubled. So perhaps it's not surprising that many ESOL programs are oversubscribed. In Massachusetts, for example, there were 17,000 on the wait list for ESOL classes in the state and 11,000 enrolled. So before I start talking about this paper specifically, I wanted to frame this research in terms of our larger research agenda on adult ESOL programs in Massachusetts. 
My co-author and I are leading a study to look at the effect of English language training on a variety of different outcomes for adult immigrants using randomized enrollment lotteries and other quasi-experimental techniques. Over the next couple years, we hope to be able to report the effects of English language training on all the outcomes listed here, criminal justice records, educational outcomes, home ownership, social integration, spillover effects from parents to children, et cetera. But what I'm going to show you today is a subset of this work. So we'll be focusing on the effects of a single program and we'll be looking at two outcomes, voter registration and voting behavior and earnings and employment. So in this paper, we use a randomized enrollment lottery for the largest adult ESL program in Massachusetts to identify the causal effect of English language training on the civic and economic outcomes of adult immigrants. Our sample includes about 4,700 individuals who applied to this program for the first time between 2008 and 2016. Our data can come from state and program level administrative and waitlist records, voter registration records, and earnings data reported to the Massachusetts Department of Unemployment Assistance. And the outcomes that we look at, again, will be voter registration, voting by election, and employer reported earnings. To preview our results, we find that attending ESL doubles the probability of being a registered voter. So it increases voter registration by 8.9 percentage points with a similar effect on voting. To provide some context for these results, this effect on voting and voter turnout is on par with large benchmark effects from voter turnout interventions in the political science literature. So it's a big impact on voting. We also find that attending ESOL increases annual employer reported earnings by $2,400 a year. And that these effects are biggest for individuals who already reported earnings in the pre-period and who entered at the intermediate or advanced levels of English ability. And then finally, we conduct a cost benefit analysis and we show that public investment in this program pays for itself through increased tax revenue, generating a 6% benefit to taxpayers. So to frame the contributions of this paper, we are contributing most broadly to the literature on immigrant integration in the United States and more specifically to the quasi-experimental literature on language skills. What we find in this paper is consistent with the body of evidence that comes from papers using age at arrival instrumental variable techniques to estimate the returns of language skills. Our results are also consistent with the emerging literature from European contexts on the effects of language training programs for immigrants and refugees. In terms of our unique contribution, ours is the first lottery-based study that we are aware of to study English language training in the US in a contemporary usual setting. When we look at the literature on adult education, um, it's very limited. And what rigorous research does exist tends to be from the 80s and 90s and is looking at ESOL classes as part of several different types of services paired with job training or other interventions as part of welfare to work programs. So that is to say in a very different context than what we're doing here, looking at ESOL as a standalone intervention. And then finally, through this work and through our cost benefit analysis, we are highlighting a policy relevant lever for promoting the integration of adult immigrants. So now that we've had a little bit of an introduction to this work, we can move into talking about the nitty gritty details of this paper. And we'll start by talking about the Framingham Adult English as a Second Language Plus or FASL Plus program. So this is one of the largest programs in the state. It serves about 750 students a year. Most of those students are in ESL classes, but the program also offers GED prep, which is a high school equivalency exam, and citizenship prep classes. So classes that help people prepare to take the citizenship exam. Classes meet for six hours a week over a 15 week fall and spring semester. The semester is tied to the local school district because this program is run by the local K-12 school district. The typical student in this program remains for just over three semesters, so they're there for over a year and a half. And there's a diversity of primary languages in this class, in each classroom, and a diversity of educational and professional backgrounds. So they have people who have doctorates in their home countries, they have people who lack basic literacy skills in their home country in the same program. There's a large Brazilian population, maybe 30 to 50% of participants are Brazilian, and that reflects the immigrant population of the local Framingham area. 
And this program is right in the middle of the distribution in terms of the time commitment it takes from students and its cost in public funding. If you were to attend this program, I've sat in on classes at this program. Uh, what happens here is not so different than what you probably experienced in your language learning classes in high school or in college. So classes are organized by English ability. There's an instructor, there are texts, and there's a strong emphasis on practical real world applications. So reading and understanding a listing for a job or leaving a message about your kid at school, things that adult learners would benefit from. So the randomized enrollment lotteries are critical for our identification strategy. This is the only program until our intervention that had been using randomized enrollment lotteries in Massachusetts. And they conduct a lottery twice a year in January and August ahead of the new semester. They receive about four applications for every seat, mostly from beginners. And I wanna talk a little bit about what happens to people who don't get into this program on their first attempt so we understand what the counterfactual here is. So, for the people who are highest on the wait list and narrowly don't get into this program, they're offered the opportunity to participate in prep classes. These are basically lighter touch services led by a volunteer, not by a formal teacher. So people at the very top of the wait list might be getting some light touch services from this program. Everyone else is going to be referred to other programs. They're going to be uh, referred to other volunteer services in the area, church groups that do English discussion hours, things like that. And they'll be encouraged to reapply. Of course, they might also participate in private language training. That's something that we wouldn't observe here. One point I wanna make in terms of substitutes for this program. So here's a map of ESOL programs in Massachusetts. If you can see my uh, mouse, I'm circling Framingham, which is where this program is located. It's a little bit of an island. So there aren't a lot of other public as a no cost ESOL programs in the nearby vicinity. So when we look at the data, we see that less than 1% of the people who ever apply to this program pop up and enroll in another adult education program in the state. So there's not much substitution in terms of free programs. The data sources that we use for this project. So we reconstruct lottery outcomes from fall 2008 to spring 2016. And we do this by triangulating across enrollment and waitlist data from the state and from the program. We also have statewide voter registration records. These records include name and date of birth, which is what we use to link to all our outcome data. And then we also merge in unique data, uh, quarterly earnings data reported to the Massachusetts Department of Unemployment Assistance. And I wanna say a few things about this data so that we can contextualize our results on earnings. So first of all, the matching process for this data goes from name to date of birth, pulls in a driver's license, which pulls in your social security number that links to your earnings data. Some things to note here, if you don't have a driver's license, if you don't have a social security number, your earnings data won't be reflected here. So for instance, earnings from undocumented immigrants, and we think we actually have a relatively large undocumented population here, they won't be reflected in this data. In addition, DOA doesn't capture data on earnings that come from self-employment or contract or gig work. And of course, earnings that are paid under the table, so paid without being reported for the purposes of taxes, won't be reflected here. Again, we have a large immigrant population. We know many of our uh, many of our workers work in domestic services where wages are more commonly paid under the table in the US. So we suspect that that might, may be happening here. So just for context, we match 29% of students in this program to employer reported earnings at some time, but we might expect based on surveys from the program that about 70% of our students are working in some way. So we're gonna be very careful when we interpret our results as interpreting it as an effect on employer reported earnings. It's very relevant for the purposes of taxes, but we're gonna recognize that we may not see the universe of earnings. And of course, there could be substitution going on from the informal to formal labor sector. So our empirical approach, we are going to instrument forever attending this program based on the outcome of the first lottery attempt. We use the first lottery attempt because reapply and of course would be endogenous. So in our first stage, we're going to relate whether or not you ever attended this program as a function of whether you've won your first lottery. We're going con to condition on what we'll call a lottery fixed effect or a risk set. This is an interaction between the semester you applied, the level you're at, and your time availability, so AM or PM session. We condition everything on this because that determines your chance of getting in. We will also condition on demographic controls, although our results are not sensitive to dropping these. In the second stage, of this equation, we'll relate the outcome of interest. So for example, being a registered voter to the predicted value of a 10 from the first stage, 
um, we'll condition on the same things and, and, our, co uh, and our coefficient of interest will be this beta one. We'll also generalize this when we're looking at data that's long at an individual by year level, we'll throw in a period effect for period relative to first lottery, we'll cluster our standard errors at the individual level in these regressions. And something to be clear before I jump into showing some results. So the identifying assumptions of this model as an IV model, of course, is first that winning the first lottery is related to the probability of ever enrolling. That's something that I can show you in our first stage in a couple slides. Second, that winning the lottery is not related to this outcome except through its effect on enrolling, given the setup we have here with a randomized enrollment lottery for uh, an ESL program that seems like a tenable and believable assumption. And I'll clarify also that, of course, these estimates are local average treatment effects, so they apply to compliers. Compliers here are people who attend the program if they get in on their first attempt, who don't if they do not. So here is our balance table. Um, so in the first column, I'm showing you the mean of each of these characteristics for the control group, that's people who did not win the first lottery. And then in the second column, I'm showing you the coefficient on having won the lottery from a regression where we're predicting the characteristic as a function of having won the lottery conditional on your lottery risk set. What you should see here is that we don't have any significant point estimates. That's good, it's reassuring uh, with a fair lottery. We also conduct at the bottom of this panel an F test. Here we're testing whether these baseline characteristics jointly predict having won the lottery. Um, we fail to reject the null. Again, that's reassuring, consistent with randomization. Here I'll show you our first stage estimates. This is basically the second panel, the, the, the table I just showed. To interpret this, winning your first lottery attempt increases the probability you ever enroll in this program by 50.3 percentage points. It increases the number of terms or semesters you enroll by 1.6. Of course, this coefficient on ever enrolling on <clears throat> for ever enrolling in the Phasal Plus program isn't equal to one because some people who lose reapply and they get in, and some people who are offered a space in this program don't ultimately show up. So here are let's get into our results and we'll start by looking at voting. So here I am plotting. Uh, point estimates from that beta one from separate regressions where the outcome is defined as being a registered voter five years pre-lottery, four years pre-lottery, and so on. What you should notice here is that there is no effect of attending this program on your pre-lottery probability of being a registered voter. Again, that's good, reassuring, consistent with randomization. We see a positive effect that begins to emerge and becomes significant four years post-lottery. To summarize this effect, we find that enrolling in this program increases the probability of being a registered voter by 8.9 percentage points. The control mean voter registration rate is seven percentage points, so this is more than doubling probability of being a registered voter. We get a very similar effect size on ever voting. Our voting results are driven by newly registered voters. In the second panel here, we're looking at the effect of attending this program on having voted in the 2010, 12, 14, and 16 elections. Something to note here is that because, of course, for every outcome we define the outcome in the post-lottery period, we have fewer periods or, or lottery samples that are contributing to earlier estimates, so it's a smaller sample. However, it seems pretty clear that uh, there's a very substantial large effect in 2016 compared to other periods. This makes sense. It's a presidential election year. It is a year when we are not going to be re-electing an incumbent, right? So those are good for turnout. And it's of course the year that Donald Trump was elected president. And Donald Trump, of course, made restrictive immigration policies a centerpiece of his campaign and presidency. So we can imagine why that would be especially uh, important for people to register to vote. Oops. So here I'm gonna show you our effects on earnings. Again, these are point estimates from separate regressions. The outcomes are defined as earnings in the periods before and after the first lottery attempt. Again, we see no differences in the pre-period. That's reassuring. And then in the post-period, we see a positive effect that emerges and becomes significant about four years post-lottery. We have an unbalanced panel here. So of course, estimates at the tails are noisier, um, but we see it sort of bopping around between the 2000 4000 mark. To summarize our effects on earnings. So in panel A, I'm going to show you whether or not there's an effect of attending this program on ever reporting income, right? If you report income, you get a one here, everyone else gets a zero. 
So we see a positive point estimate that would indicate a positive effect on people being employed in a formal wage reporting sector, but it's not significant. We do see a positive effect that is significant, a number of quarters of positive earnings reported. When we look at our average annual earnings, we do two different types of estimates. Our first estimate we pull over all years post lottery. We prefer the estimate where we pull from years two to 10, which would coincide with the period after which the median student would have completed their English language training. And it's where we see the positive effect begin to emerge and sort of stabilize. And this is where we get our $2,400 a year additional uh, employer reported income. Something to note here, of course, is that we have uh, uh, plenty of people who are not reporting any income. So there are lots of, of zeros in the sample when we think about the control mean average. Please, Christelle. Yes. Uh, coming back to the voters, could you please clarify uh, the condition to register as a voter? Yes, uh, yes. So to register, yes. So to be a registered voter, if you're an immigrant, then you need to naturalize. So you need to become a citizen. If you come in uh, with documentation and you have a green card, you can usually naturalize within three to five years after being in the US, right? So time spent is, is important. Um, if you come in without documentation, there's no current pathway for you to become a citizen and you can't register to vote. If you uh, become a citizen, you can pretty much uh, simultaneously register to vote. And many people do, do that. So something I was going to observe at the end, but is relevant now is that this effect on voter registration is likely also an effect on naturalization. So people who are eligible to become immigrants deciding to do that, maybe even using resources offered by this program to go through that process. Thank you. Okay, so getting to this table, I'm gonna show you our placebo test. So here we're checking whether there is an effect of attending this program on your pre-lottery outcomes. We find no significant point estimates. Again, reassuring formalizes what we were looking at in the graph in the pre-period. We do a number of other things to consider robustness, most of which I'll leave to our paper, but we consider whether different versions of names and dates of birth could be driving results, assumptions about missing data, et cetera. Our results are very robust to these different specifications. Finally, we do also look at whether out-of-state mobility could be a source of bias for our earnings. So since we only observe voting and earnings that are reported in Massachusetts, if people were differentially moving out of state, that could bias our results. So we do a few things to look at this. So first, we match two voting records for Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, and Florida. These are states that are the major receiving states of people who move out of Massachusetts. So we find very little evidence of out-of-state mobility. Quite frankly, some of the matches we do find, we're dubious about it. We have some people with very common repeated names, and we certainly find no difference for winners or losers. So little evidence of out-of-state mobility from voting records. We also look to see if there's differential within states. So moving out of the Framingham area mobility based on voter registration or employer zip code. We find no evidence of differential mobility at all. In fact, I think the bias would work against our estimates in this case. And then finally, we conduct a bounding exercise where we make super conservative assumptions about individuals who stop reporting earnings after having reported regular earnings. We lose some precision in these estimates, but maintain our, point, our positive point estimates. So we look at the bulk of this uh, these findings and take these results together and, and infer that there's relatively little out of state mobility for this population over this time period and certainly not enough to be biasing our results substantially. So to look at heterogeneity of effects, I'll focus on just a few dimensions here. So uh, in terms of our earnings effects, uh, the effects are driven by people who are already employed. They're also largest for people who entered at the intermediate or advanced level, of course, these people probably also earned more to begin with. For our voting effects, we find positive point, significant point estimates for both beginners and people who entered an intermediate or advanced level. Uh, one thing to clarify about becoming a citizen in the US is that you do have to pass an English language proficiency test. Quite frankly, the test is very, very simple. It's in, you know interpreting three sentences in English. So for most people, that's not an actual the barrier to becoming a citizen. There may be other reasons why they've chosen not to become citizens yet. So finally, we conduct a cost benefit analysis to determine whether this is a good investment of public funds. And one way that we assess this is by looking at the effect of attending this program on the tax liability. So the taxes paid by applicants. 
To estimate taxes, we use the NBER TaxSim program. And of course, to make an estimate of tax burden, we need earnings data, which we do have, but we don't observe family structure. So what we do is we estimate the change in tax liabilities under different assumptions about family structure, spousal income, number of children. And then we create, we create a single aggregate estimate that's weighted by the share of each uh, of individuals in each family structure type in the Framingham area. So we get this estimate of tax liability. I should clarify that we, because of our preferred estimates, we actually assume no change in tax liability and no change in earnings for the first two years post lottery. But we then carry this estimated change in tax liability through 27 years, which would be the remainder of the working lives of a person in this program, um, assuming retirement at age 65. And we net out the public cost of supporting one student. One student will typically apply or uh, enroll for 3.2 semesters and cost about $4,500 in public funds. So summarizing those results here in this table. Um, this table summarizes the results of our uh, effects on tax revenue. Uh, each row is representing a different bucket of taxes, but we can focus on the first one, which we think is the most policy relevant. So here we see that the average annual change in tax payments is $347. The internal rate of return for the public investment in this program is 6%. So at any discount rate less than 6%, uh, we are paying for this program and in increased tax revenue alone. At a discount rate of 3%, that's a column five here, we go past the break even point 20 years after the first lottery attempt. To bring this back to the individual, of course, I've shown you this about $2,400 a year increase in employer reported earnings um, with caveats that we don't know whether there's some substitution going on there. If we simply carry this forward and net out the additional tax burden for participants, this would amount to an additional $55,000 in take home pay. So, to summarize what I'm showing you, looking at tax revenue alone, public investment in this program is generating a net benefit to taxpayers. Of course, there may be other social benefits that we haven't been able to measure and to take into account in this calculation. And then looking at the uh, take home earnings of individuals and with caveats around not observing the universe of earnings, we find that these results are very consistent with this program having economically meaningful private and social returns. So to summarize our findings, we use a randomized enrollment lottery to identify the effect of English language training on adult immigrants. We found that attending ESOL doubled the probability of voting or registering to vote. Um, so this result, of course, could reflect an effect of English language skills on an individual's interest in politics. It could also, as we discussed, reflect an effect on uh, individuals deciding to become naturalized, whether through their interaction with the program or through English language skills, making them feel like they want to incorporate more. We also find that attending ESOL increases employer reported earnings by about $2,400 and that the results are largest for those who were previously employed and for people who started above the beginning level of English proficiency. These findings are consistent with the theory that language skills are complementary to other forms of human capital as proxy by prior earnings and prior English ability. And then finally, we showed that public investment in ESOL pays for itself at increased tax revenue, generating a 6% annual benefit to taxpayers. And our results passed a number of validity checks. They were robust to alternative assumptions about missing data and didn't appear to be driven by out-of-state mobility. So finally, just to close here, uh, I wanna touch on three things briefly. The first is mechanisms. So we have been interpreting the effect of attending this program as an effect on English language skills. But of course, participating in the FASL Plus program implies other things that may affect these same outcomes. So we mentioned that if you attend this program, you might become interested in other services offered by it. Maybe you wanna pursue your high school equivalency credential, or you think, oh, I'll finally file my citizenship paperwork and become a citizen. You might also become part of a larger social network. You're almost certainly getting in touch with instructors and administrators who are really savvy and knowledgeable about connecting immigrants to services and opportunities that help them be successful. So certainly some of the effect of this program is probably operating through those channels. Second, we're really interested in generalizability. So I've shown you that this is a typical program in terms of time commitment and cost, um, but it's one program serving one specific population. And we wanna know if we would find similar effects in other ESOL programs. So as part of that larger research agenda, I spoke about 
at the top of this talk, um, we have recruited three additional programs in the state to implement randomized enrollment lotteries. Uh, we're hoping to recruit some more, and we are hoping to generate some more generalizable findings in the next couple years using those lotteries. We're also going to be conducting some sort of simple OLS estimates comparing waitlisted and enrolled students statewide. So we should have more to say about that soon. And then finally, I want to land by talking about the policy implications of this work. So we've talked about the overwhelming demand for ESOL services and the declining public support for these programs. If you buy the results we presented here, you prioritize employed, engaged immigrant population and a representative votership, then of course a clear case can be made that we should increase funding to support English language training for adult immigrants. It's a win-win that appears to generate meaningful private and social benefits. So thank you for listening to my presentation. I'm very much looking forward to your feedback. Thanks a lot, Kirsten, for your nice presentation. Thank you. So we have one question from the participant. Uh, it's from Paz Sri Vatsan. Uh, I allow you to, to talk. You can ask your question below. Hi. Hi. So we are not able to, to hear you at this time. I might ask the question for you. <laughs> okay, so given the diversity of educational backgrounds, is there any difference in impact of the intervention amongst low skilled versus high skilled workers? The question is, is there any difference uh, in the impact of this program for low skilled and high skilled workers? Yes. Okay. So we don't observe as much background information about um, this population as we could wish we could. It's, this is especially true of our control group. So we're limited in what we observe about them. Um, what we can say is that the effect is larger for immigrants who had higher levels of English proficiency and who were previously employed, right? So from that perspective, that would be consistent with the effects being larger for high skilled workers. A challenge here, of course, is that we might expect that we observe more of the universe of earnings for high skilled workers who are employed in the formal sector than for immigrants who might be undocumented and might not be reporting all of their wages. So I think that's an open question and maybe it's something we can think about in our ongoing work and surveys about how to capture that information. Yeah, thanks. So I'll let the floor to Meg Hi. Um... I have a very simple uh, question just about, I was curious how uh, many years these people have typically been in the US. So um, this relates to, to understanding more why it's um, here, it's the earnings that seem to be affected. Uh, and uh, relating to some of my own work, we saw more that for very newly arrived immigrants, it what it did was basically help them find a job also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we don't see as consistent results around that margin. Um, so we don't observe how long these immigrants have been in the country. We know that some are, are naturalizing relatively close to their first lottery, which would imply that they may have been here for at least five years. I don't think that these are all completely recent arrivals. I think it is possible mm -hmm. that these immigrants have been mm -hmm. here for a little bit longer than might be the case if this was sort of a coordinated like immigrant integration project. Uh, it's a good mm -hmm. question. Maybe we can get at that again with like some additional um, surveys of applicants as part of our, our larger research agenda. Thanks. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I can probably ask uh, one question, Elsa, is that fine? So I was wondering, and probably I didn't uh, catch that. You, do you have information on when they naturalize or whether they naturalize and when they, you don't, right? No, we don't observe anything about citizenship status. And that's too bad because it would be useful to parse out the undocumented or at least never eligible to naturalize population. Um, but no, that's not something that is like publicly available to observe. Okay, and um, for the language skills, whether I, you, you mentioned that the language required for naturalization is probably a very basic level of English. I was wondering uh, through your, um, the ones that attend the formation in the ling English language, whether it's a much higher level that they get through these um, trainings 
And if that's the case, then you would imagine that it's not really naturalization. It's, it's not that they are disproportionately higher, having a higher probability of being naturalized. They are getting a level of English that's beyond. In it. Yes, let me clarify. I think it's I think that's right. I don't think that it's that they're gaining the English abilities they need to take the test. However, we know from surveys that even relatively high proficient immigrants cite concerns about the English language skills as a barrier. So I do think that on that margin of confidence that might be um, making people not want to take it, even though, as I said, I think the pass rate for the test is 98% or something. It's very high and it's a very basic exam. But on the other hand, I think that it's very possible that there is a channel that English language ability works on that increases the probability you want to become a citizen. So in the US, compared to some other similar countries, our naturalization rate is relatively low. So there are people in our country who are eligible to be citizens, and they're choosing not to. And it varies a lot by sending country. Uh, the naturalization rate is lower for, for example, immigrants from Mexico, et cetera. Maybe they're thinking they'll return. They're kind of hedging their bets, who knows? Um, so I think it is very possible that English language skills are promoting sort of a sense of participation in, in the American culture, maybe interest and engagement in politics, watching English language news as opposed to Spanish language, Portuguese language news. And that could be making people more likely to naturalize, even if it's not really working at the margin of making you able to pass the test. Does that make sense? talking about cultural identity, maybe Diego can ask uh, this question. Hi, uh, so I, I think you mentioned that you don't know the countries of origin or the nationalities, but you know the languages they speak as a first language, right? So we don't actually know the languages they speak as a first uh, language either. We actually have to impute our race and ethnicity measures and nationality measures based on last name. However, um, if you're going to ask something about could we look at heterogeneity by that, I think that's very interesting. I think we can do more to impute based on last names, particularly mm -hmm. for our Brazilian populations. We have a lot of the same last names come up, so it's pretty clear what language probably someone speaks and what country they come from, but we don't observe it in our data. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, my question was about the heterogeneity as well. So. I wonder, what would you expect to happen? I'd be interested because I do think we want to dig into this more. No, I don't know. I was thinking like maybe from some countries or if we if you change it to languages, from some languages it would be easier to to learn English than from others. Yep. I think certainly a yeah. question would be if you speak a language that's spoken by a lot of people in Framingham, does that in some ways depress the weight at which you're learning English? So if you're part of a big Brazilian community, of course, we have some research that shows that immigrants and ethnic enclaves acquire the host country language more slowly. Uh, you could imagine that being the case. Um, yeah. It is interesting to see these classes where you have a lot of Portuguese speaking people, and then you have one person who speaks Arabic and one person who speaks Chinese. And, you know, just as in any language class, they're all together, but maybe their experiences and incentives for learning the language are a little bit different. Yeah, I agree. But I was also thinking that maybe, I don't know if you have a Mexican and a Brazilian, probably in Mexico for just being closer, they are like more exposed to English. Than Brazil, yeah, I, so so they can like pick up faster. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I I don't know, and it's interesting because uh, unlike in most parts of the United States, this is kind of an exceptional Massachusetts thing to have a big Brazilian population, right? Elsewhere in the U.S., you'll find very large Spanish-speaking communities and Mexican communities. Yeah. So yeah, it would be interesting to see how that works. We have slightly fewer Hispanics as a non-Brazilian Hispanics in this population than statewide, but it might still be something we could get at. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And in turn, the, the network uh, of Brazilian might help for primary general learners too. So yeah, I think that's definitely true. Okay. So we have no more questions at this time from the participants. Uh, we might ask the common question and talking about what do you think about your external validity for other country in the, US, in the US? Yes, so external validity. So do I think that these results would also apply elsewhere in the US, other programs? Is that the question? Okay, so yes. Yeah. So as I said, we're very curious about this. Let's just think about Massachusetts. 
I would say actually this these effects may hold. Maybe this program is a little better than some and, and worse than others. It certainly requires less time than some programs in the state. There are some very intensive English programs in the state that would really, really impact your English skills in a time, but six hours a week is actually pretty light uh, commitment. So I suspect these could be sort of middle of the road estimates for Massachusetts, but we'll learn more about that. Thinking about other states and other programs, one thing I will say is that sort of in the same way that K-12 education is not so different state to state necessarily, uh, adult education programs operate in similar ways in, in other places. So they use similar placement tests, similar curriculum, that sort of thing. Um, so from that perspective, we might expect the results of this program to not be so different than programs elsewhere in the United States. But again, I think that there is probably an inter interesting interaction between uh, what's being offered by this program and this local environment that immigrants are in, certainly what they're bringing to, to this class and uh, the incentives that they have to learn based on what they perceive as the returns to English ability, the kind of jobs they wanna have, whether they're planning to live here for a short time or a long time. Um, and so it's difficult for me to think exactly about how it would, uh, about how valid they would be to all contexts in the US, um, maybe to contexts in the sort of greater New England area, this would be most applicable. Thanks, thanks for the clarification. We have another question by Mete. Um, maybe I think you're allowed to unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. I, um, I think Kirsten already touched The question was, um, if, if uh, you have some information about the curriculum, so we can understand a bit more how much ESOL might improve the earnings potential or the, the language proficiency. So is the ambition of the program to take them from they know nothing about English or basic to fluent or something less? I guess you don't have grades or something that or some hard measure of their skills, but maybe something less like information about the curriculum they are taught could be useful. Yeah. No, that's good. And I think um, that's a good point you bring up about grounding, like how much link English does a program expect people to learn? So I'd say at the beginning levels, people are entering with almost no English ability. Okay, so very, okay. very low. Um, and the program really stops out at a, a pre-higher education level. So if you were wanting to go to college in the United States and take exams to show your English language proficiency, you would need to go somewhere else for services at that level. So they're not teaching mm -hmm. academic English. So the highest level is sort of sub higher education level. Of course, there are community colleges and programs nearby that you can pay to you know, train in that level, but that's not something this program offers. So it's in the sort of band between um, really no English at all. Some people will end the program at this sort of intermediate level if they, if they progress one level. A turn they might go from no English to like English enough to be able to speak on the phone with their kid's teacher to say that their kid is sick and understand that kind of interaction. Um, and that's probably the space that most of the participants in this program are, are ending at. And some people might go all the way up to sort of graduating out of the program and they might then be looking at, oh, okay, can I even improve it more? Could I attend higher ed if that's something that they'd be interested in or get other kinds of credentials around English? Thank you. Thank you. We have a question from Yasser Setki. So I let you unmute yourself. Okay. So I may ask it for Yasser. So how important are uh, English education programs to attract international students? So given the fact that English uh, talking countries are usually considered as attractive destination for students. So the question is, uh, would these programs be attractive to like international students? Is that the question? Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so like visiting students basically, instead of immigrants. Uh, I think that that's unlikely. If, if there was a visiting student who was a high school student, then they would be receiving lots of great English instruction in, in a high school program. If they were uh, looking to do higher ed, I think that they would probably consider it relevant to pay for services. 
um, based on my interactions with this program, you know, our population's age, the median age individual is about 35. So they're, they're, they're older residents of the area. Sure, thank you. I just had one last question, um, which is regarding, I imagine you don't have that information, but in case you would have the sector where they're likely to be employed in, um, whether you can disentangle in the channel of uh, informal to formal sector, um, those who are employed in, in the sectors that are traditionally employing from the informal sector. Uh, for instance, in my own research in France, I see in the construction sector uh, an effect that seems to be driven by a movement from the informal to formal sector. Whether, I don't know if there's geographical variation in the areas that are on the outskirts that are normally known for uh, to be employed in the black market, there you see a higher effect, uh, an indirect way in, in to, to see the effect. No, that's, that's a great suggestion and something we should dig into more. We actually do in, we do observe the NICS code of the industry that someone is working in. We looked at this to find that uh, it was not the case that people were changing industries. So that, that wasn't an interesting outcome. Um, and we did, of course, find that I think more than half of our population was represented in the sectors you might expect, including construction, working in restaurants, sort of healthcare giving services, those things. I do think there's probably more we could do if we dug into specific um, sub industries and then looked at a change on did you end up reporting at all versus did you just report more income. Also, we could probably look at whether the income you were reporting likely represented your full income. You know, if you're only reporting $5,000 a year and you're a 35 year old man living in Massachusetts, likely with a family, that's probably not all the money you're, you're taking home at the end of the day. Um, so that's a really great, great suggestion and, and specifically starting with construction would be a good place to start. So I think if there's no more questions, uh, we're gonna stop here. Um, Kirsten, thank you so much for your presentation today and, and your time for the discussion at the end. It was really interesting. Uh, if you can just unshare your screen, I will share mine too. Um, let me just share my screen. So I'll just remind you that we have the next session of this um, seminar is going to be next week by Jaime who will uh, present his paper on the role of firms in the assimilation of immigrants so we're staying in the same thing and uh, as you know uh, you can see the upcoming presentations on our website we're going to update uh, the schedule for the next semester soon and we keep receiving submissions on a rolling basis and we review them on a rolling basis actually. And you can send your paper to our email address that you can see here or on, uh, you can also find this information on our website. And uh, as you know, the seminars are online, uh, also on our page. Uh, it's a weekly seminar that happens on Mondays from 5.30 to 6.20. Uh, so we're really happy for the, the discussions uh, today, and we hope to see you uh, next week. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank